Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here, and murder to death! Thought we'd just get that out of the way early again today. Anyway, as you know, Skyrim is a very extensive game, with an excessive amount of locations, friends, and foes for the Dragonborn to come across in their journey. And even over half a decade later, so much of what this game has to offer has yet to have been uncovered by everyone. So today, in an effort to correct such a problem, we'll be taking a look at yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, Part 36. Starting off, Mosering Pass is a small Reichling encampment, occupying a mountain passage northwest of the Temple of Mirak on the island of Solstheim. These giddy goblins seem to have crafted quite the settlement here. But don't get too close, as they have a strict no-soliciting policy. Well, at the top of the peak overlooking the area, the local Reiklings seem to have put up a small flag, proudly marking the surrounding location as theirs. But, just underneath the flag, lying against some rocks, will strangely be a random dead Reikling. What happened here? While at first I found myself rather perplexed, it would appear as though the poor guy likely tripped and fell while climbing up the rocks. It's even possible that this Reikling was the one who put up the flag in the first place but just didn't happen to make it down promptly. The other Reiklings back at the camp haven't moved his corpse yet, so there's a good chance they're completely oblivious to the unfortunate fate that befell their companion. Poor little guy, made it so far only to be murdered to death by gravity. I know I already said it once. Next on our list, we trade the mountainous peaks of Solstheim for those of Skyrim itself as we head out to High Hrothgar, citadel above the clouds and home to the legendary Greybeards where we can find one particular greybeard named Wolfgar. He's not an especially notable character, considering he literally never speaks to the player and just sort of ruffles around the compound in his robes. But he spawns in at a base level 150, so try not to turn him hostile. Regardless of his silent but deadly nature, Wolfgar is actually a reference to the old English epic Beowulf where Wolfgar was an officer and counsel to the Danish king, Hrothgar. Likewise in Skyrim, Wolfgar is a man living in High Hrothgar. Skyrim is littered with Beowulf references, but this is probably one of the coolest and most blatant. Now let's just hope there's not a character in the Elder Scrolls named Grendel. Coming in at number 3, Valix Sane is a legendary Dramora pirate, who's said to operate a vessel in the Abyssian Sea, harassing the coast of Cyrodiil. This is already fascinating enough as is, as Dramora are a type of Daedra, typically found serving Maroon's Dagon in Oblivion. So the fact that one somehow became a pirate in the mortal world is pretty extraordinary. During the College of Winterhold quest, Forgotten Names, the player gets the opportunity to meet this character as they investigate the disappearance of a handful of students. Apparently, some of the reckless kids attempted a summoning ritual in the midden dungeon underneath the college itself. In Forgotten Names, it's revealed they had indeed successfully summoned Valix Sane, but were unable to control the Dramora, who promptly soul-trapped them. You'll have to repeat the ritual they performed, resummon the Daedra, and defeat him in order to complete the quest. Once you meet him, Valix will actually try to convince you to let him go in exchange for telling you where he hid some treasure, but make that bargain at your own risk. Now, the cool thing here that this quest doesn't tell you is that there's in fact an entire book about Valix Sane. The book, Pirate King of the Abyssian, is a short, anonymously written poem about the character's actions. Furthermore, you can also encounter Valak as a boss guarding one of the Dark Anchors in the Elder Scrolls Online, which takes place thousands of years before the events of Skyrim, though he offers no unique dialogue. It seems this seafaring Dramora has been at his craft for quite some time, and clearly developed a reputation. For fourth spot, Farron Sadri is a Dunmer vampire and alchemist, living at Castle Volkahar. He acts as a potential merchant should you side with the Volkahar clan in the Dawnguard DLC. Well, curiously, he shares a last name with some very non-vampiric Dunmer we meet back in Skyrim. In Windhelm, Raven Sadri is the owner and proprietor of Sadri's Used Wares, a general goods shop in the Grey Quarter. He makes a point of being extremely careful not to purchase stolen goods, and even goes so far as to ask you to return a ring he purchased that suspects was stolen. Raven's sister, Edessa, also lives in the city, working on the docks. Considering the shared surname, it seems very probable that these upstanding Dunmer citizens have a very close relative 
that isn't so ethically inclined. Halfway through at number 5, we head back to the island of Solstheim, specifically just outside of Hrothmund's Barrow, an ancient Nordic tomb. You see, Hrothmund was the name of an ancient Nordic warrior and leader who built Thurskmead Hall and led a tribe of Nords on the island. He died in the Third Era fighting a wolf named Onyage, and apparently his followers decided to build him quite the resting place. In fact, in the Elder Scrolls III Morwin's Blood Moon DLC, Hrothmund's Barrow is a location the player can visit, and to gain entrance, you even have to speak the name of the wolf that killed Hrothmund. Well, fast forward a few hundred years to Skyrim, and you'll notice that outside of the location are a number of stone pillars flipped on the ground. They seem pretty insignificant and out of place at first, as they don't have a discernible purpose. They're not marking a trail or pathway, they just sort of sit there. However, if you look at these pillars from a bird's eye view, you'll notice that they're in fact outlying a wolf, the very animal responsible for Hrothmund's passing. It looks like the Nords decided to pay homage to such a creature in a pretty neat way. Sixth. The Poetic Edda is a legendary collection of songs and poems, compiled by various ancient bards of Skyrim. It's of special significance to the Bard's College in Solitude, who will send you on a couple of quests to recover pieces and narratives from the text. Well, the Poetic Edda is actually something that exists in the real world, with a similar function. It's a collection of anonymously written Old Norse poems from another literary work called the Codex Regius. Many of the poems in the real Poetic Edda touch upon Norse creation myths and deal heavily with the culture's mythology, as do the tales in Skyrim's version. It appears the bards of Skyrim certainly have some shoes to fill. And maybe some hammers. Next, Before the Storm is the name of the quest that begins immediately after the player escapes Helgen, with either Rayloff or Hadvar. In it, you flee towards Riverwood and alert the local townsfolk to the recent dragon attack. They'll request that you inform the Hold's Jarl, Balgruf and Whiterun, of this news, and ask that he send troops to Riverwood, as the village is entirely defenseless. Once you arrive before Whiterun, you'll find the gates locked, and the guards will question what business you have in their city. One of your potential dialogue responses is, quote, Riverwood calls for the Jarl's aid. This appears to be a subtle nod by Bethesda to the 2003 film Lord of the Rings Return of the King, where, in one famous scene, Aragorn barges into the King of Rohan's court and says, quote, Gondor calls for aid, after a series of distress beacons were lit. The references don't stop there, though. Similarly, Whiterun's entire city layout seems heavily inspired by that of the capital of Rohans that we see in the Lord of the Rings films. If only Bethesda based Farangar off of Gandalf, too. Coming at number 8, Serpent's Bluff Redoubt is a large Forsworn stronghold in the Reach. It consists of a small outdoor camp and also a dungeon located in the ruins of an old fortress that's also occupied by the Forsworn. The dungeon itself is quite small, but notably, spawned in on a large stage just in front of a podium-like stand will be a Forsworn-aligned Hagraven. Now, we know that in the Reach, Hagravens and the Forsworn, or at least some Hagravens and the Forsworn, have a bit of an alliance. They're often seen together, and it's even suggested that Hagravens play a major part in the ritual that creates Forsworn Briarheart soldiers. No matter, the Hagraven and Serpent's Bluff shouldn't be too much trouble to neutralize. However, in one of the Forsworn tents outside of the ruined castle will be an interesting note, which reads the following, quote, The Matriarch grows weary of your hesitation. Our people control the entire eastern slope of the Reach. All save Sunguard. Take it, and the invaders will be cut off from all retreat. But we must move now, while its defenses are still weak. Summon the tribes, do what you must, but if you do not act, she will find someone who will." End quote. What is going on here? The note alludes to capturing Fort Sunguard, a massive fortress south of Serpent's Bluff. But that fortress is already in Forsworn hands. At least it is by the time Skyrim starts. Additionally, who is this matriarch? Whoever it is, it's clearly a powerful figure. It seems very likely that it could be the Hagraven we met inside the dungeon. Perhaps she indeed holds a lot of significance within the Forsworn. We're never really given any information at all about this note. My theory is that Fort Sunguard was possibly raided and captured by the Forsworn shortly before the events of Skyrim began. Perhaps they successfully wrestled control of it from the Empire, or occupying bandits. This matriarch character again is very fascinating. 
As mentioned, we already know the Forsworn and Hagravens have some sort of deal going on or diplomatic alliance. But if the Matriarch is that Hagraven we encountered inside of the Serpent's Bluff dungeon, then that would imply that some Hagravens even hold considerable leadership positions inside of the organization. No matter, we may never know what's truly going on here. Another one of the Forsworn's many secrets. Getting close to the end here at number 9, back at the Volkahar castle in the alchemy lab, the Dragonborn can find the corpse of an alchemist on a table, just across from a skeleton. While undoubtedly the subject of some vampiric experiment, this may in fact be a reference to the 1999 film The Mummy, where, in one scene, one of the lead protagonists, a woman named Evelyn, is placed on a table parallel to a mummified skeleton, whom the main antagonist, another mummy, was trying to bring back to life by sacrificing Evelyn. Perhaps the Volkahar mages were trying to do a similar thing. Maybe they wanted to bring this skeleton back to life using the soul of the alchemist. Either that, or it's possible the vampire wizards just like to aesthetically set up their corpses or something. And finally, last on our list, Rebel's Cairn is a small cave in the Reach, and is the primary setting of the quest, Rebel's Cairn. Well, just outside of the cavern lies what may be a familiar set of rocks to many players. A mound of stones piled atop of each other, surrounded by a number of bones with a steel sword lodged into the top. This, of course, is a reference to the legend of King Arthur, specifically the tale of the sword in the stone, which involved a legendary sword lodged into a rock that, according to the myth, could only be removed by the true King of England. Likewise, it seems many unworthy have tried and failed to take this weapon for themselves in Skyrim. That is, until you came along. All you gotta do is press the interact button. But with that, we are going to wrap up. Yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Part 36. Which of what was shown off today did you find to be the most noteworthy or interesting? I personally found the Reichling that seems to have slipped off the rocks to be rather hilarious. And what tiny details, easter eggs, or references do you know of that I've yet to cover? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Thanks for stopping by, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.